our first plan. Feeny can water you. Oh, I don't want to be watered on by Feeny. Look at each other. Say it again. We pledge eternal love. We, we pledge, pledge eternal, eternal love. love. I'll tell you what's happening to us. We've just seen three of the worst movies of the year. Some according to me and some according to Roger. And this is a special edition of At The Movies dedicated to lousy movies, the stinkers of 1982. So bad, we can't let them go without just one more kick. <laughs> Joining me in the balcony, Roger Ebert, film critic of the Chicago Sun-Times. This is Gene Siskel, film critic of the Chicago Tribune. One thing we probably ought to make clear right about this show right at the start is that it's not going to be devoted to run-of-the-mill stinkers of the week with low budget. Good. Instead, we're going to talk about the kinds of movies the film studios like to refer to as major motion pictures, movies that were supposed to be good, but were not. Gene, your movie. Okay, my first choice for one of the worst movies of the year is In Chan, and I'm in good company. Esquire magazine, I noticed, recently picked it as the worst movie of the year, one of the great dubious achievements of the year. <laughs> in Chan, the Korean War battle was a major turning point for Allied forces. In Chan, the movie is a disastrous waste of an enormous amount of money by some reports as much as 30 million dollars uh, spent all on one big uh, the, one of those typical big star mm -hmm. epics where every few minutes one familiar face after another pops up in the most unlikely spot for example here's a way to really kill the reality of a korean war movie in a flash watch who pops up in the middle of this attack scene on a bridge <laughs> That's right, Jacqueline Bissett in a sundress, a bombshell amid the bombshells. <laughs> and there are more stars, Ben Gazzara, Richard Roundtree, <coughs> Lawrence Olivier as General Douglas MacArthur. I sort of enjoyed Olivier in the movie, but that was it. The rest was just one close-up of a building or a tank or a bridge, and then no surprise, whammo. It blows up real good. To think of the uh, good movies that could have been made with all the money spent on Inchon, it almost makes this more than just a bad mm -hmm. movie. It's sort of shameful. You know, I guess I should have known there was something wrong with this movie. They started, started when they started offering you an around-the-world cruise if you just go to see That's it. That's right. They had a lottery. I don't know if anybody ever got that, but I'm telling you, even that, they're shortchanged. And Olivier, who was a great actor, seemed to think he was in another movie. At one point, one of his attacks doesn't work out right, and he turns his back to the action and says, take a letter. And he starts dictating his resignation to Harry Truman, and it's almost like a Shakespearean speech. He seemed to be totally in a different world than uh, but this, the world of the Korean I, War. I, I, know, I thought he was okay, but this, it's just a waste. There was nothing special about this film. You're right. Star there was one thing special about it. Wasted $30 million okay. on a movie that hardly anybody saw. One of the worst movies I saw last year was called If You Could See What I Hear. Mm. And this was a movie that was all the worst because it was supposed to be inspirational and uplifting. The movie was allegedly based on the true story of Tom Sullivan, a blind man who specializes in doing anything that sighted people can do. Well, that's great, except that Sullivan comes across in this movie like a refugee from Animal House. His idea of overcoming his handicap is to party all night. <laughs> now, here's a typically depressing scene from the movie. Well, uh, your friend is blind? 
More or less. Yeah. Yeah. Then why the hell is he driving? Because he's the only one who's sober. Isn't that inspirational? A blind man overcomes his handicap and find, somehow finds the inner strength to become a drunk driver. <laughs> in another scene, he skydives and almost kills himself and pulls down a power line, and then he has a great time in a bar where he grabs women and pretends, oh, he did, didn't know they were there. He's also a great wit. At one point, he's offered some drugs, and he says, no, he's too busy drinking himself to death. <laughs> if this movie really is based on a true story, and if Tom Sullivan's friends really do encourage him in his brainless exercises in self-destruction, then this movie would depress me even more than it already does. You know, it's one, you really have to go far to make a movie about a handicapped person that has you not caring about that person or, in this case, hating that person and wanting to get away from them. I found the film particularly offensive. It seemed to be saying that a, a person with a handicap mm -hmm. can get away with anything. And, mm -hmm. of course, even handicapped people resent that. My test was pretty simple. I thought that the guy in this movie, who I suppose is not exactly like the real Tom Sullivan, at least I hope not, mm -hmm. was so obnoxious that I would do almost anything not to be in the same room with him. Exactly. So that's not very interesting. Or the same movie theater with him in particular. Right. Okay, <laughs> next at the movies, one of the biggest flops of the year featuring the film debut of a great artist. Now it is my pleasure to present, if not the worst movie of the year, at least this, the worst movie dialogue of the year. And it comes <laughs> in a film called Yes, Giorgio, with opera star Luciano Pavarotti making his film debut and maybe his film farewell, playing an Italian tenor on tour in America who falls for a pretty Boston doctor, Catherine Harold. In this memorable scene, Pavarotti, <laughs> playing a singer known as Giorgio Fini, tries to convince Catherine Harold to accompany him to San Francisco. The great line of dialogue comes at the end of the scene. Last night, I could not sleep until I know what to do about Pamela. Then, all at once, I know what I must do. A ticket to San Francisco? Si. Come, carissima. The plane leaves in 45 minutes. Oh, no, 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 no. Thank you. A very generous offer. In fact, the nicest I've had all day. But in case you've forgotten, you're a married man with two children. And I love my wife and my family, and we have a wonderful life together, but my private life is my own. Do me a favor, Giorgio. Go to the airport, get on that plane, and fly out of my life forever. Do you think I do this for my own pleasure? Believe me, I do this for your own good. <laughs> Believe me, it's for a fling, no? These two, but more. Please just leave me out of your fantasy. See, there's no fantasy. This ticket is real. I am Ria. Pamela, you are a thirsty plant. Fini can water you. Oh, I don't want to be watered on by Fini. Who can blame her? <laughs> Who would want to be watered on by Fini? <laughs> Wouldn't you have loved to have been on the set when they were shooting that scene and maybe you would have said, you know, try and write this one again? I wonder if anybody on the set realized that it was going to get all these bad laughs and then... I hope that they thought it was funny, because if they didn't, they're really dumb. Uh -huh. I also had some more questions when I watched this film. Who wants to see the great Pavarotti sit on a pie? Or get into, <laughs> or get into a food fight? Or be called tons of fun by a child? <laughs> this actually happened in this picture. I have the answer, though. Apparently, the people who put up the money for this film wanted to see all that. And maybe that's because they thought that they would have to make Pavarotti cute to make him sell to Middle America. Well, his music sells better than Yes, Giorgio did. This film is an insult to opera, to Pavarotti, and to us. Every time he sings, it's like uh, Gene Krupa doing his big drum solo where a basketball player sinking the big shot at the end of the game, you know. I will sing this aria just for you. It's like it's a stunt or something. Know. You know, and then when he sings, it's beautiful, but it's in a totally different movie. Yeah, just two pictures. And I think mm -hmm. uh, 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 interviews with him and just listening to him sing the same music mm -hmm. would have made a much better film. Or they could have made a comedy and really made fun of opera, you know. The one thing that this picture needed was one of the Marx Brothers, maybe, okay. to come on stage and save Pavarotti from himself. Moving right along, a few years ago we started to get all those cut-rate horror films that I like to call the dead teenager movies. Now you know what they are. They're the exploitation films that are set at summer camp or on prom night with a mad slasher stalking innocent teenagers. And they were pretty transcendently awful, but now there's an even worse trend in movies, which I call the horny teenager <laughs> movie. Movies where oversexed slow learners with disciplinary problems creep through the locker room trying to get a peek at the girls' gym class. And the worst one of all was an enormous box office hit named mm -hmm. Porky's. Mm -hmm. Here's the basic scene from all of these movies. 
Father McNeil, I can't see a thing, damn it. You be quiet. You're starting to leave. Hey, beat it, did you? But I'm missing it, man. Would you shut up and you stay on your side? Damn it, will you move it, you large... Don't be alarmed, girls. This is just your health department. You better get yourself out of here, otherwise you'll get in big trouble. In spite of the juvenile snickers of some, this is a serious matter. <laughs> that, that seducer and despoiler must be stopped. He's extremely dangerous. And, Mr. Carter, I'm certain that everyone in this room knows who that is. He's a contemptible little pervert. Who's bound breaker? Well, I'm sorry. Hmm. But I've got him now, and I'm not going to let him slip through my fingers. And that's another basic scene in these movies, the teacher is Cretan. Mm -hmm. Now, there's nothing <laughs> wrong with teenage movies about love and lust, and some are romance. There's an old tradition in these movies going all the way back to the beach party films and all the way forward to Brooke Shields in Blue Lagoon. But movies like Porky's are so dirty-minded, they aren't mm -hmm. any fun. Mm -hmm. They don't see women as friends and lovers, but as mindless targets for idiotic, practical jokes. And you know, one of the strangest things about Porky's was that there wasn't a single friendship between a male and a female in this whole movie. Mm -hmm. The movie had a really weirdly frightened and hostile attitude toward women. Yeah, that's the way I did it in my review. I thought the same way. I thought uh -huh. this is a basically a hate women picture. And I know there are lots of people, since this was an enormous hit, it was uh, gross over $100 million, who are mm -hmm. thinking, Come on, it was just innocent fun and just laugh. I honestly didn't laugh. I thought it was very, very cool. Women as oversexed butts of jokes, mm -hmm. and guys uh, as ogling them all the time. Plus, there was a lot of racism, and racism used to, to have you laugh at the, vic the subject of the mm -hmm. racism. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a mean little picture, and I am stunned by its success. Do you think that maybe it just kind of snowballed, that there were two or three scenes in it that were kind of sexy and people talked to each other and they I went think, to see it? And I think there was that. I think they had a very sophisticated uh, ad campaign that brought a lot of people It was really in. a sick picture. I think so. Next at the movies, a miserable sequel. Or was this one a prequel? Tough to pick the worst sequel of the year. There were so, so many. But Amityville 2, The Possession, may be it, giving <laughs> us just what we didn't want, further adventures of that haunted house. Actually, Amityville 2 is a prequel. A movie that takes in time takes place in time before the beginning of the original movie, focusing on how the house came to be haunted in the first place. We get to see a young man turn a shotgun on his parents and a little brother. I'll spare you that scene. <laughs> but how about this piece of nauseating material? The scene early in the picture when the local priest comes around to bless the house. Uh, my bedroom. My bed, too. I picked that throwing up scene, not to gross anybody out, but to make a point of how offensive this movie really is. Someone connected with this film decided that that scene needed the throwing up, that it wasn't horrible enough without the barfing, and that person or persons was dead wrong. The mood was already set. You didn't need the extra shot. The music told you what was going on, but my suspicion is that that scene was included because they knew they didn't have a good script here in this picture, and they needed to spice it up with some shocking scenes and it's for that extra bit of sickening material, and there's lots of it in this picture. That's the reason that Amityville 2, The Possession, makes my list as one of the worst films of the year. And you know, one of the films I'm looking forward to seeing least in 1983 is a movie that's going to be called Amityville 3D, in which they're yeah. probably going to throw up on the audience. It'll probably be called Amityville 3, The Sublease or something. <laughs> when I was a kid, down in Downsay, Illinois, we used to go to the carnival in the summertime, and they had a tent called the Geek Show. Exactly. Where they had a guy who came around, and he would bite the heads off of live chickens, and you'd yeah. pay 50 cents to see that, right? Mm -hmm. And you only wanted to see it once. Well, I think I learned my lesson in the Geek Show, and I don't have to see movies like Amityville, too. 
They are made by people with absolutely no shame. They are only interested in getting some kind of rise out of the audience and, you know, just throwing something special at them so we get the sh shotgun stuff on the little kids. Mm -hmm. At that point, I really wanted to leave. I wanted to ask the people who were in the theater, why didn't more of them get up and split? I can't Good understand question. it. Well, now we come to what I consider the smarmiest movie of the year, a real piece of tear-jerking dreck named Six Weeks. This is a movie starring Mary Tyler Moore as a millionaire mother of a little girl who's dying of leukemia, and Dudley Moore as a congressional candidate who enters their lives, falls in love with the little girl, and then falls in love with her mother. It's also bittersweet, it's sickening, because this is a serious subject, and it really shouldn't be handled in this way. See, for example, if you can sit through this scene without squirming. The dying little girl stages a mock wedding ceremony for her mother and the man that she hopes will keep her mother company after she dies. Okay. Raise your glass. Good idea. That's right. And repeat after me. We pledge eternal love. We pledge, we pledge eternal, love. eternal love. Look at each other. Say it again. We pledge eternal love. We, we pledge, pledge eternal, eternal love. love. And agree to be married. And, and agree to be married. Be married. For now. For now. Because there is no always. Because there is no always. And we will remember this pledge. And we'll and remember we this pledge. Until we no longer remember. Until we Until no longer remember. remember. I now pronounce us man, child, and wife. You may now kiss the child. <laughs> I really resent scenes like that, that, that try to exploit my emotions by, instead of creating characters that I feel sorry for and that I feel bad about, giving me all of these prefabricated elements. It's just really cheap. And there's one slight technicality in that mock marriage there, and that's that Dudley Moore is already married. He has a wife and son at home, and the little girl knows it. But the movie never really deals with that question, with a lot of other questions, like who the little girl's father was or why the little girl isn't getting any medical treatment at all, or why Mary Tyler Moore and Dudley Moore are allowed to get stuck in some of the most unlikely, unbelievable, unsayable dialogue I've ever heard. And at the end of this movie, this is unforgivable, the little girl has one last wish. She doesn't stop halfway. She wants to dance the lead in the Nutcracker Suite at Lincoln Center. And of course, they arrange it, and she gets her wish, and then she dies. This kind of, kind of shameless exploitation of a serious subject is enough to make you want to throw pies at the screen. Guess what? Guess what? You I remember, don't. don't you? Yes, you like this movie. Yes. That's right. <laughs> Anything else you want to say? Yeah, I'll say a few things in okay. this defense. I thought that all three of the performances were interesting, and I thought uh -huh. Dudley Moore's character was a wise-cracking sort of but low-key politician was amusing, and I enjoyed it. The little girl I thought was fine. A picture like this that goes flat out for emotion, it's a risk. It's either going to get you a little weepy, a little teary-eyed, it got me a little emotional, or you're going to have a reaction like yours, and I did not have the reaction that you did. I was sitting there, you know, I got some letters from people who said, well, how can you make fun of this serious subject? And my mm. answer is, I'm not making fun of the subject. The people who made this movie are I making fun of the I, subject I, I by making the film in the first place. I disagree place. with you. I thought the film was truthful in the emotions. The specific events, Roger, the Lincoln Center bit, it's grandstanding, I grant you. But I they're going you after, very much. They're going after emotion, and I, they got mine, okay? Well, they, they got, got yours, but okay. I, I've still got mine right here. Okay, when we come back, another <laughs> look at the stinkers of the year. Yes, he's back from a long, hard year. Aroma the Educated Skunk, helping to recap the year's worst movies the stinkers of the year. And in addition to the stinkers we've already reviewed, we both decided to name a few more to round it out to five stinkers apiece. Mm. My first stinker was, if you could see what I hear, a movie that was supposed to be inspiring, but made its blind hero look like an irresponsible clown. Mm -hmm. Next was Porky's, the dumb movie about dumb teenagers undergoing an idiotic initiation to sex. Then there was Six Weeks, a movie that shamelessly exploited every cornball element in its story about a dying little girl who wants to play matchmaker. I also had a couple of stinker sequels on my list, including Halloween 3, a boring, slow-paced thriller about a plan to fry the brains of the nation's youth, and Grease 2, a congealed movie that went over the same ground as the original Grease, 
but at half speed. Well, my worst movies of the year, Amityville 2, The Possession, the year's worst sequel. What a category, huh? <laughs> <laughs> With a priest throwing up and shotguns trained on little children. I also hated Inchon, the multi-million dollar Korean war fiasco with almost as many beautiful bombshells as exploding bombshells. And yes, yes, Giorgio, what more can I say <laughs> than what the film said? Feeny can water you. And I can't help from adding to my list two more films. Neil Simon's I Ought to Be in Pictures with a smart aleck daughter learning to accept her smart aleck father, Walter Matthau. Lately, Neil Simon has been writing gags, not characters. And finally, Partners with Ryan O'Neill and John Hurt, an insulting depiction of a couple of cops, one gay, one straight, trying to solve some murders in the gay community. They tried to play this one for laughs, some fun. And so much for 1982 and for the stinkers of the year. Join us next week when Gene and I look at some much better movies in a special show called Winners That Were Losers. These are movies we like a lot, but they lost out at the box office. So until then, we'll see you at the movies. <laughs> Promotional considerations paid for by Ward Johnson, Johnson Wax, and Super Pop Popcorn. Hooray for Raisinets. Now you can enjoy one of the all-time favorite movie candies at home, Goobers and Snow Caps, too. Hooray for Raisinets. Glade Aerosol, the air freshener that instantly makes your home fresh. One spray and you'll know the difference Glade made. Super Pop Popcorn, a tender, delicious, nutritious snack at an economical price. Super Pop Popcorn, it's the one snack you can't eat alone. Super Pop.